12.06. I'm on a time crunch to get this out to you, so I want you to take your Bibles and open them up quickly. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Glad that everybody is here. I pray you've had a blessed week and that you still feel the victory no matter what the Astros did this week. It was not too great. Um, Last Sunday, I actually wore my Houston Astro tie. I have one Houston Astro tie, and I won it la- wore it last Sunday. And it wasn't prophetic, but I told somebody, I said, you know, I better wear it today in case we don't win another game. So uh, I don't know if it was my fault or what, but anyway, uh, <laughs> Jesus is still the victor, and it's still okay no matter what. So it's good. It's good. Um, Luke chapter 6, we're talking about convictions. Last week we talked about convictions to know Jesus. Today we're talking about the convictions to grow in Jesus. And I, I really pray as I begin, and if I can preface this in this, just simply say, I, I, I'm asking all of us to really open up our hearts to hear what God's word is saying to us, uh, that you'll love me after I finish the message as you, if, if you love me now. You may not love me now, and it's okay. Uh, you better love me now, but hope you'll love me at the end. Uh, as well, Um, but I want to really speak about this conviction to grow in Jesus. Um, As we pray, let's also remember to pray for uh, the the Nunley family, Ricky and Donna Nunley, their family, Um, his dad, Brother Bobby, is part of our church for a long time, passed away this morning, and he was an incredible man, but today he's rejoicing in God's house, and so um, if anything, we're not sad for him, we rejoice with him but we do feel for his family that left behind, so we pray God's peace upon them. So let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for letting us be together in your house this morning. On this day, great first service, but God, that service is over. We are in another service. God, different ones, Lord, that have come to hear the same message, Lord, that you had us to share. And I pray that our hearts would be open and our minds would listen and hear, not just with our ears, but also with our understanding that you can make a real change and impact in our lives because our desire is to grow in you, God, because we want to honor you with all that we are and who we are. I God, I love you, and I give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 6, I want to I want to read, begin by reading this, verses 46 through 49. This is not the apostle Peter talking. This is not James or Matthew or Mark or um, anyone else. This is the Lord Jesus Christ who is speaking here. So I want us to really hear what Jesus is saying because he's speaking to us today. He says, so why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, When you don't do what I say, that's verse 46. I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. It is like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock, and when the floodwaters rise and break against the house, it stands firm because it is well built. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house without a foundation, and when the floodwaters sweep down against the house, it will collapse into a, uh, a great heap of ruins. We're talking about convictions this month. Last week, it was the convictions to know Jesus, and we want to know him thoroughly. Today, it's the conviction to, to, to grow in Jesus, to grow in him completely. And next week, it's going to be the conviction to go with Jesus and to go with him indefinitely. Know, grow, and Go. We said last week that there are basically two definitions for convictions that really have an impact on us in the context of having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. One definition is that it is the act of convincing a person of error or the admission or recognition of truth. And this is the definition that we typically think about when we think about the convicting of the Holy Spirit. When we've done something we should not have done or we should have done something that we were supposed to do but we did not do it, All of a sudden, we feel that convicting in our hearts, or maybe the Holy Spirit's trying to reveal to something we haven't seen. We feel that convicting in our hearts and that nudging on the inside where the Spirit of God is speaking to us, trying to show us where where we may have strayed here, where we may have made a mistake here, where we should have done something there, where we should have seen something here. That's the Holy Spirit. It's that convicting. Again, the first definition of, of conviction is that it's the act of convincing a person of error or the admission and recognition of truth. The second definition of conviction is this. That is, is a strong persuasion or belief in which a person is thoroughly 
convinced. And it was this definition that we used last week when we talked about the conviction to know Jesus. To know meaning to have a, 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 an understanding, the importance of understanding who Jesus actually is. And last week we said the three things that we really needed to know concerning Christ are that he is the son of God. Number two, that he is the only way to heaven. And number three, that he has a heart for people unlike anybody else to the point that God is willing to go to immeasurable distances just to show us how much he does care about us. That God's not limited to human ideology when it comes to caring for people. God goes far beyond to show people how much he cares. So the three things we need to know, have a conviction to know about the Lord are that he is the son of God, two, he is the only way to heaven, and three, he has a heart for people unlike anybody else. Today we're going to talk about the conviction to grow in Jesus. To grow in Jesus. And listen, I, I pray I don't offend anybody here because believe me, that's not my heart. I want to speak with compassion and the love of Jesus because Jesus loves all of us. But hear me, though God is slow to anger, the Bible says that he is merciful, he is abounding in love, he is ready to forgive. He is also a God that is holy, he is a God that is just. And he desires that we who claim his name not only say that we love him with our mouths, but that we also love him with our lives. That's not just a declaration of what we say, but it's actually how we live. You know, it's, it's what James, the writer James, James chapter 2, verse 22 says. He says, faith and actions work together. He says in verse 14, if you have faith but don't show it by your actions, what kind of faith is that? Amen. Verse 17, he says, uh, he says, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. In other words, what James is saying here is that there has to be a congruency between what we speak with our mouths and how we actually live with our lives when it comes to having a relationship with the Lord. And I would go and venture to say it needs to be that way in every aspect of our life. That there has to be a congruency with what we say and, do, and also to what we do. Pastor Steve, this past Wednesday night, he spoke on the subject of repentance, which, which was to this very point. He said that repentance is more than just words. It's an action point where there's real change in direction in how we live. In other words, the things that we say with our lips, line up with the things that we are doing with our lives. I don't know about your printer, but I have a kind of printer that sometimes get out, gets out of alignment. And so you can always tell it doesn't necessarily look correctly. So you can do a, a function on the computer, just print out a page to see if your printer is in alignment correctly so it's doing everything it wants to. And if the printer is in alignment, guess what? All the lines, for instance, these vertical lines across your page, all the lines will be perfectly straight. But if the printer's out of alignment, and you know what I'm talking about if you've ever, have ever done it on your computer, if it's out of alignment, the lines will be jumpy. They won't necessarily be straight. So what do you have to do? You have to do something. And what you do is you just, it's not just simply acknowledging the fact, hey, my printer's out of alignment. How about that? You don't just recognize, hey, obviously my printer's messed up because it's not printing. You actually have to do it. If you want to fix it, you actually have to do something. You have to take the step. You have to take your mouse or your keyboard or a button on your printer and you actually have to mash the button because guess what? The printer by itself doesn't just realign itself without you first taking the action step of doing something to make it happen. Amen. See, the conviction for us to grow in Jesus is really about an action step. The first decision is the, is the one where we recognize that God is important in our lives and we want him to be growing in us. And the second is also about where we say to the Lord and to the Holy Spirit, I want you to convict me because I want to make sure that I am always going down the right way. I want to become everything that you want me to become. But see, that takes more than just lip service. It requires an action on our part. Why? Because without it, there's confusion and distortion within. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. He doesn't really know what he wants. And if we're saying one thing with our mouths, but we're living something else in our, with our lives, then guess what? We are double-minded, and on the inside, we are totally distorted, and we are totally confused. We want our actions, friends. We want our actions and our lives that reflect the declarations of our mouths. I know that's what I want for me. Anybody for you? This isn't about being legalistic. It's not about being ultra-religious. It's about having a personal relationship with Jesus that's more than just verbal. It's actually identifiable and it's visible. I, I've said it before, talking about love. You can say up to a person, I love you to the moon and back. But if there's no visible demonstration of that, of that love, your words actually mean nothing. 
It is the actions that we take. It is the things that we do. It's the, it's the fidelity and the faithfulness of our affections that demonstrate to our spouses, guess what? What I say is what I mean. It's true. So you can't say to your wife and you can't say to your husband, I love you, I love you, I love you, then give your affections to somebody else. And Jesus speaking to this point in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, he makes this, the comment, he makes the statement. He says, why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? What is Jesus talking about? He is talking about somebody whose actions are not congruent with how they, or their words are not congruent with what they're, what they're doing. They're not lining up. They're saying all the right things, but what they're saying hasn't penetrated to their hearts to the point that it's affected how they live. Their lives are out of alignment with their pronouncements. I'm talking today about the conviction to grow in Jesus. And my prayer for all of us is that we will be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slower to get angry. And allow the Holy Spirit to speak to all of us, myself included, because I looked in the mirror before I came to church and I still don't have a halo. <laughs> it's still not there. So I'm talking about really all of us, and I include myself in this, all of us, that we still, all of us, allow the Holy Spirit to speak into our lives because guess what? All of us still need to be growing in our relationship with Jesus. We all still need to be progressing towards spiritual maturity. And here's the deal. We can all still grow. There used to be a lady that attended our church. She's already gone to heaven now, but she was all of about 4 foot 11. Very dynamic, very inspirational, very super intelligent, incredible speaker, incredible minister of the gospel. And I remember when she was in her mid to upper 80s, standing behind the podium, because she actually would speak for us sometimes, and you could barely see her over the podium because she was like this. Sister Vida Killian. And she said this from behind that podium. She says, he's still working on me. And I'm sitting in the audience listening to her say that. And I'm thinking to myself, my Lord, she's as close to heaven as anybody could be on earth. And if she thinks that God is still working on her, I must be a project that's in bad shape. Because he's got to do a lot in me for even me to be close to what she is. And yet here she was saying, he's still working on me. It's like the old song, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Yeah, yeah. Took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth, and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be because guess what? He's still working on me. Yeah. And he is. We all need to be growing. We ought to be becoming more spiritually mature in our relationship with Christ. No matter how long we've been serving the Lord, there's still more. Yeah, yeah. So I want to approach this today. This growing in Jesus from a twofold position. One, I want to approach it from the position that we want to grow in the sense that because we have a strong conviction to grow. We have a strong persuasion of belief. Secondly, I want to approach it from the position of why we need to be willing to have the Holy Spirit work in us so we can grow. One approach deals with a conviction from a persuasion of belief. The other approach deals with a conviction in the sense that we're allowing the Holy Spirit the right to speak into our lives so that we may grow and mature and become everything that God would have us to be. Why is that important? It's important because of what Jesus went on to say in the rest of Luke chapter 6 that we read. He said that the flood of waters of life will come. Temptation, sin, sorrow, sickness, everything, it will come, whatever. But when it comes, if we have a solid relationship that is congruent with how we're living, we're going to be okay. But if it's not... If the words of our lips do not match the attitudes and the actions of our life, he says, guess what? If it's going to hit that house, talking about us individually, the totality of our being, and the Bible says in the end, Jesus says it will collapse into a heap of ruin. You know, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is talking about the same kinds of things, and he goes on to say this in verse 20. Jesus says, yes, you can identify a tree by its fruit, so can you identify people by their actions. You can identify a tree by its fruit, Jesus says, and you can identify people by their actions. What is Jesus saying? He's saying the old thing we always like to say, that actions speak a whole lot louder than words. Then he goes on to say, verse 21 of Matthew 7, not everybody who calls out, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of the Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, we cast out devils in your name, we perform miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you, get away from me, you who break God's law. Jesus' point is that proclaiming of a relationship doesn't mean you have a relationship. Proclaiming a relationship doesn't necessarily mean we have a relationship. And that, Jesus goes on to say, 
that it's possible to do some things in his name even and yet still not be in a relationship with him because why? Because our life is not consistent with what we're actually saying. God doesn't want that for any of us. God desires a real relationship with all of us that is honest and true. You know, when we come to Jesus, we accept him as Lord. We're born into the kingdom of God. We are new creations. We are born, new baby born believers. And in that infancy stage of being a believer, guess what? We are prone to make mistakes. Just like a baby learning to walk. We will fall down. We will scrape our knees. We will have errors. We will do things wrong. But as this relationship grows, so we get stronger in the Lord. Because guess what? A baby's not going to keep falling. At some point, that baby's going to walk. Then that baby's going to run. And then you better keep up with that baby. <laughs> but that's the thing about a relationship with God. It doesn't stay in infancy. At least it should not. We should be growing. And yet, sadly, so many times we see a lot of people in churches all across the land who are still in a state of infancy. And they've been coming for years. Pastor Mike Perky used to, used to say that some Christians have been babies for so long that God has to part the whiskers to get the bottle in. We need to have a conviction to grow. Why? It's because God wants us to be more than we are. God wants me to be more than I am. God wants you to be more than you are. See, God's goal is that all of us become mature in him, that we become more like Christ every day. Listen, over and over again, the scripture tells us that we are to grow in him. Ephesians 4.15, we are to grow up in every way into him. Hebrews 6.1, so let us stop uh, going over the basis of Christianity again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature. Growing in Christ is supposed to be the goal of every believer because if a believer stops growing, if we stop our momentum and stop moving forward, guess what? We're going to stop rolling backwards. You can't stay the same. There's no such thing as a static believer. We're either growing or we are regressing. And you and I have to have a sincere desire to grow in a relationship with Christ. There has to be a genuine desire for spiritual maturity. Listen, I, I, I've learned just in being in God's house for years and working with people that you cannot look at a person at their physical maturity and determine their spiritual maturity. Physical characteristics does not necessarily represent spiritual maturity because I've met some adults they were spiritually immature. They were more like babies. And I've met some young people whose spiritual maturity was way above them, and they were like adults. See, one, one pastor said it like this. He says, we have churches filled with baby Christians, people that are spiritually still in the nursery, which is fitting because they naturally have the characteristics of a baby. They are selfish, completely self-centered, and if they don't get what they want when they want it, they tend to cry. Listen, from the moment we are born again into God's family, we are to begin to move from a place of infancy to a place of maturity. That's why growing in Jesus needs to have to be a conviction of our hearts. And I wish I could stand here and tell you that spiritual maturity just happens naturally. But it's not true. You've got to want to grow. You've got to decide to grow. You've got to make an effort to grow. And lastly, you've got to continue to grow. It's something that is intentional, something that requires commitment, effort, determination, and work. That's why the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 2, you must crave spiritual milk so that you can grow. It is said that one day a young man comes to Socrates, the great philosopher, and says, I want you to be my teacher. Socrates looked at him, grabbed him on the shoulder, began to walk him. Walked him right down into the sea, Walked them down until they're literally chin deep in water. This guy's just like, I don't know what's going on, but this is Socrates. And Socrates turned and looked at him. What do you want? I want you to be my teacher. And all of a sudden, he grabs him on the head, and he pushes his head into water. The guy's thinking, man, this is some weird training, but okay. <laughs> he's holding his breath. And then all of a sudden, when he, it's, it's time to come up for air, he... He starts thrashing. He, he starts thrashing the water. And finally, Socrates takes his hands off of his head. And the guy's head pops up out of the water. He's spitting water. He's like, what in the world? And Socrates looked at him. He said, when you desire to learn as much as you desire air, then I will be your teacher. 
When we really begin to crave spiritual things the way a baby craves milk, Amen. we will begin to grow. Amen. When we really desire it. I got a lot to say. Listen, three reasons. Three reasons why we should have strong convictions to grow in Jesus. This is from the position of persuasive in our hearts. We are persuaded to believe it. First, it's because we love him. We have a love relationship. That's why I want to grow. That's why I have a strong conviction for it. Because I love him. Listen, when a man marries his wife and marries his bride, it's not at the end of his pursuit to know her. When you get married, that's not the end. You haven't, you don't walk, it, done. That's, it. that's not the end of the pursuit. You continue as you, as you get married, you, as you learn to know them, you get to know them years and years, and still after years of marriage, you're still learning them. You never stop learning the things about your spouse. Why? Because you want to love them better. You want to love them greater. You want to love them more. I've talked to guys that have been married 50, 60 years, and they tell me the same thing, that we're still learning things about our wives. I've been married 28 years, and I'm still learning things about Debbie. We're still growing in that relationship. Why? Because we want to love each other better. Amen. There's still new things to discover. Still new things to that, 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 that want to do, to, to, to know about each other because we want to love each other greater. We, we want to know Jesus more. We want to grow in him because we love him. Somebody once said that the art of marriage is a lifetime commitment to the studying of the image, the canvas, the paint, and the brush so that after a lifetime together, they'll end up with a masterpiece. We should have a strong conviction to grow in our relationship with Christ. First and foremost, because we love him. And listen, how can we not love him based upon what he's done for us? In fact, Romans 12, the Apostle Paul writing about this very same thing. He says, it's the very least thing that we could do is give our bodies as a living sacrifice to the Lord because of everything that he's already done for us. Yeah. Listen, I love Jesus because of everything he has done. And it's out of that love relationship that I have with, have with him that I want to know him more, serve him more, and grow more in him. Because why? Because I want to love him better. Yeah. Secondly, secondly, I have a conviction of growing Jesus because I love him. Secondly, because, number two, because I want to have a strong relationship. Amen. I want my relationship to be strong. I want a relationship with the Christ that, makes, that lasts a lifetime. I do not want a seasonal commitment to the Lord. I want a lifetime commitment to Jesus. Too many people are seasonal in their relationship with the Lord. My grandmother had a book. My dad's mother had a book. It was entitled... God Rode Destroyer X, a true story about a man that was in, on a destroyer in World War II out in the Pacific, faced amazing sea battles, kamikazes, all kinds of things during World War II. And he talked about in the book that how they passed out Bibles to everybody on the ship. And he says every night the guys were reading their Bibles, every night the guys were praying, they were attending the chapel, the chapel services that the chaplain would give on the ship. And he says it was throughout the entire war, the course of the war, the four years, always in their Bibles, reading. But he said when the war ended... And the ship is coming back to the United States. He says, as we entered San Francisco Harbor, and you can see the Golden Gate Bridge, he says, guys begin to throw their Bibles over the edge of the ship. Why? Because their relationship was only seasonal. And I've seen a lot of people make seasonal commitments based upon the fact they're going through something, there's a crisis point in their life, and so they, they really get into the church, they start reading their Bible, they start praying, but guess what? As, as that, the season begins to push away from them, their relationship begins to wane. We have to have more than a seasonal relationship. We have to have a relationship that will last, a committed relationship with him because if it's seasonal, it will never stay. I spoke to a young man in, in the first service and he has given his heart to the Lord just recently. Something had happened in his family and given his heart to the Lord and I looked at him and I made this statement to him. I said, this relationship you have, I know there's a part of it that you're doing it you know, because of this that's happened. And I said, but it has to be more than because of something that's happened in your family. It's got to be something that you desire for yourself. Yes, right. And listen to me. When it comes to personal relationship with Christ, the only kind that will last is when we do it for ourselves. Amen. See, we've got to have more than a seasonal. Because I, I, Can you imagine having a seasonal relationship with your spouse? Or a seasonal relationship with, with your other members of your family? As long as things are good, they're there, but if things aren't, they're not. Maybe some of you can relate to that. The strengthening of the relationship is tied to the love that is expressed in that relationship. Amen. You see, it's because we love that we'll study, grow, and learn, and even change. Because we not only want to love well, 
but we want our love relationship to endure. We want it to be strong enough so that it will last. We have the conviction to grow because we love him, because we want our relationship to be strong. Three, we want to become what God desires for us to become. In other words, we want to reach our full potential in our relationship. Listen, living things grow when they're being fed and they're being nourished properly. All living things grow. That's true of people and that's true of plants. Living things grow when they're being fed and nourished properly. And for growing to be a conviction of our lives, there's going to have to be a premium on spiritual things just like we put a premium on physical things. I don't have time. I'm looking at that clock. It's just a scary looking clock right now. Uh, there's a lot of spiritual disciplines that we need to have that I won't take time to, to do. But listen, I'll say just a couple of them. The scripture, reading our Bible, there needs to be a, a premium discipline in our hearts. You, you cannot watch the TV for three hours and be on Facebook for one hour and read your Bible for three minutes in a day and say, I'm growing. It doesn't work that way. Open it up. Read it. Before you read it, ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate it to you so you can understand it. It's not about reading 10 chapters a day. It's about really just taking the time to read and understand. Let the Spirit of God speak to you through it. I love the Word. God's Bible, the Word, is doctrine so we can know what's right. It reproves us so we can, so we can know what is not right. It gives us correction so we can get right. It gives us instruction so we know what to do that is right. We need it. Not only that, we need to be praying. And blessing the food, bless this meat, let's eat. That doesn't count. And we're still praying as an adult the prayer, now lay me down to sleep. That doesn't count either. We need to pray every day. It can be in the morning, it can be in the evening, it can be in your commute, going to work, wherever you're at. You take the time every day, same time, and pray. Pastor William did a great job speaking about this last week at Elevate. Read God's word, spend time with the Lord, and then as you get through praying, as you're praying, stop. Don't keep talking the whole time. Just stop. Be still in the presence of the Lord and let God speak into you. There's a lot I could say here. I don't have time. Community, being community, being relationship and community, being church, being worship, being outreach, being missions. All these things are helping us to grow. Spiritual disciplines to help us to grow. Because we love him, we want a relationship with strong, we become everything he tends for us to be. Real quickly, three more things why we should desire the conviction of the Holy Spirit so we can grow. One, it's because we do want to grow up. 1 Peter 3, 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus, uh, our Savior Jesus Christ. We should want to grow. How do we grow? We oh, One man said through experience. Well, how do we get experience? Guess what? Another man saying it's by making mistakes. And that is how we grow. It's learning from the mistakes as the Holy Spirit quickens our heart. The Hebrew writer, Hebrews chapter 5, he talks about this relationship with God. He says that we are to, to grow. We're supposed to move from the milk of the word to the meat of the word. His point is that we are to be growing in this relationship. But again, we have to want it. I remember as a kid, I always want to be older than my age. Anybody remember that? When you're a kid growing up, how old are you? You was always, you know, it was never like I'm just 10. I'm, I'm 10 and a half. You know, we always, we, we always want to be older in our age, but we wanted to be younger in our responsibilities. As kids, we wanted to be older in our age but we still wanted to be younger in our responsibilities. And it's the same way for a lot of Christians as well. we got a lot of mature people that want to be mature believers, and yet they want to behave like they want, as like a new believer. But all that is, for instance, an excuse not to submit themselves to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Some of us are still singing the song, I'm a Toys R Us kid. <laughs> I don't want to grow up, you know. I don't want to grow up. I'm a Toys R Us kid. Yeah, Toys R Us is closed. Breaks the heart. Just pause and breaks the heart. But in essence, that mentality is still their struggle and their excuse they've had for years. The Apostle Paul in Romans 6 says, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? He answers, of course not. Since we've died of sin, how can we continue to live in it? It's Peter Pan and his lost boys living in Never Never Land. They're there not because they can't leave. They're there because they'd rather stay in their childhood fantasy than actually leave and face responsibility. It's no wonder that they actually call them lost boys. How many do we have sitting in churches across our land that are lost because they're refusing to submit themselves to the conviction of the Holy Spirit and deal with the real sins in their lives? We've got to want to grow up. Amen. We want the conviction. I want God to convict me because I want to grow up. Yes. Secondly, I want Him to convict me because I want to learn. Yes. I want to learn. Learning is a process of trial and error. 
That's how babies learn. It's trial and error. They stand up, they fall. They stand up, they fall. They get their balance. They get their balance. We learn. You teach them. You show them. You correct them. We learn to grow in Jesus when we're open to the Lord's teaching and the Lord's correction. In fact, believe it or not, we should want that for ourselves. We want God to teach us. We want God to correct us. Because when we do, we'll have we'll make wiser choices. We'll make right decisions. We'll grow in our understanding of who Jesus is. Why? So we'll abound and more, bound and bound, uh, more and more in his grace, more fruitfulness in, the, in our lives when we're submitting ourselves to his correction. In fact, the Bible actually says God disciplines those that he loves. My dad used to, when we would get disciplined at home and after that would take place, dad would always say to me, you know I love you. I don't know if you ever heard that, but that, I heard that. I think I used that line myself <laughs> later on. You know, not, not abuse, but just discipline. Right. Correction. Why does he correct you? Because I love you. I don't have the time, but you can go read Hebrew, uh, Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. Read, read, read Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about the correcting hand of the Lord, that he chastises us or he disciplines us because he loves us. He wants us to be strong in our faith and not falter in our walk. I do know this. God is more concerned about your future than he is your feelings. God is more concerned about your character than he is your comfort. We should desire the conviction of the Holy Spirit because we want to grow, we want to learn, and here's the last one. We want to go in the right direction. Pastor Steve, if you come, I will try to close. And I'm driving down the road and I'm going to a place I've never been before. I take my phone and I open up Google, Google Maps app and I put it up there. Of course, I got it plugged in so I can hear it through my stereo. I put in where I'm going and guess what? That thing begins to tell me the way to go to get there. And here's the thing about it. If I miss my turn, my app does not panic. You know what my app does? It just redirects me. All of a sudden it says, turn here. Turn here. And, and, and here's the thing about it. No matter how many times I miss my turn, it'll never panic. It, all it does is says, go here, redirect here, turn here. What is it doing? It is still trying to get me to my final destination. And that's God. That's God in our lives. That's the convincing and the convicting of the Holy Spirit. No matter how many times we miss our turn, he's going to keep talking to you, going to keep whispering in your ear, keep telling you, turn here, do this, go there. You got to make that decision, do that. But here's the deal. It's still up to us to turn the steering wheel. My app would still be talking today if I didn't either shut it off or end it where I was supposed to go. See, when it comes to the growing in our lives, it's still up to you and I to make those decisions. We still have to grow. Every day we have to be willing to allow the Holy Spirit to convict us, show us when we're on the wrong road so we get on the right road. Because every day we are facing new challenges, new temptations, new sins, new struggles, new this, new that. I don't have time. Later, you can go read Ephesians 5, 1 through 11, Galatians 5, 16 through 25, Philippians 3, 12 through 17, Colossians 3, 1 through 10. The bottom line is that we need to have a strong conviction to grow up in Jesus. We don't need a relationship with God that is a mile wide and an inch deep. That's nothing. We need a relationship with Christ that is just as wide as it is deep. Mile wide, mile deep. So that we can withstand the tests so they can make the greatest impact in the world around us. But again, growing in Jesus is not accidental. It's intentional and it is purposeful. We make the decision to grow. Amen. But when we do, Amen. man, what God does in us, Hallelujah. phenomenal. I'll, I'll close with this. A man took his daughter to a carnival. They got to the carnival, they're walking around seeing all the rides and all the things, and all of a sudden his daughter saw the popcorn, uh, uh, cotton candy stand. Her eyes got really big. She said, I want cotton candy, so she runs over to the cotton candy thing, and, and he says, Austin, he said, give me a cotton candy, the dad says, so he, the guy sticks in there, and he's getting the cotton candy all around it, and you know, you love cotton candy, man, it's just, just pure sugar. <laughs> Sticky, but good, you know, it's just, just, and when he gives it to her, that thing's, I mean, that thing's like huge. She's holding that little white cone stick. It's like. And his daddy looked, looked at his little girl. He says, 
She says, baby, that's awfully big. Are you sure you can eat that? And she says, yes, Daddy. I'm bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. <laughs> and don't you know that that's what God wants us to be? So big on the inside. Bigger on the inside than on the outside because when God is big on the inside, man, what we're able to do through him on the outside is overwhelming. But we've got a desire that. We've got a desire to grow in him so he can use us. We can become all that God would have us to be. Listen, I have a conviction to grow because I love him. I want my relationship to be strong. I want to become what God wants me to be. I have a conviction uh, to, for the Holy Spirit to help me to grow because I want to grow. I want to learn and I want to stay on the right path. And as long as I submit myself to him, if I'm taking the time to, to pray and read and be in community, and guess what? I find my God using me in ways I never thought he could use me. If we'll just allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, I have a conviction to grow. Last week, I have a conviction to know him. He's God's son. He's the only way. He has a heart for people like none other. And today, it's about I have a conviction to that I'm going to grow. I'm not going to stay in a place of infancy. I'm going to move to a place of maturity. That when I walk, I know that Jesus walks with me. Because he reflects my life. It's not just what I'm saying with my lips. But he is the reflection of my life. Because having a relationship with him is not something I do just on Sunday when we come here for a pep rally. It's what I do when I walk out this building. And I'm in my community. I'm with my family. I'm at my job. I'm in my school. Christ is still living in me. And he's demonstrating what I say. The things that I do and how I... It's Christ in us. Hallelujah. Stand together. Father, I praise you. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. God, we want to grow in you. We want to grow in you. God, we don't want to be static. We want to keep moving forward in our understanding and knowledge of who you are because we want our lives to make the greatest impact of those around us. I want people to say of me, as they said of the apostles, we can tell they've been with Jesus. God, let that be my life. So I can do more, so I can love more, so I can have greater faith. I can give more, help more. God, we use me. Real quickly, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Maybe you're in this room. The Holy Spirit has spoken to you. In your life, if you had to judge the, the status of your relationship with the Lord, it is either static or non-existent. And you've struggled and you've been struggling with the same thing for years. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to you today about really growing. It's time to mature in some things. It's time to have a real relationship with Him that's not seasonal, but it's lasting. I don't know, maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, but if that relates to anybody here, you, you're ready to grow in the Lord. You're, you're tired of the struggle. You're tired of the static. And you're ready for God to do something greater in you. Would you lift your hand right where you're at? Would you just lift your hand real high so I can see it? I see hands, a lot of hands all over this room. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I want us to do this because the time has already gotten away from us, but I want to do this. I want to open up the altars and I want to invite us to come and find a place of prayer, and especially you that lifted your hand. Can I encourage you? I know the hour is getting late, but I, I think that if you can spend just a few minutes in the presence of the Lord and really begin to pour out your heart to God, that I really feel like God will meet you where you're at and he will speak into your life. Because we want, we want our life to be in alignment with our words. We want the congruency of our life to represent what we say. We want to have a relationship with God that lasts and it's real and it's life-changing. Can we find a place of prayer? All of this altar, come on, can we come? Can we come? A lot of hands that were raised, all of this building. Can we all find a place of prayer? If we must go, please slip out reverentially. Thank you for being here. We got Elevate tonight. Lots of good things this week, but can we come and just spend some time in God's presence? Amen.